Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John, this is many a true nerd, and welcome back to our Fallout Tale of Two Wastelands. Well, last time, we killed all the slavers and freed all the slaves, so, okay, there's my good deed for the month, marvellous. And today, given we freed some children from Little Lamplight, I'd say we ought to go and see how they're getting on, but, before we do that, there's one crucial thing we need. You see, my adventures last week left me right on the end of a level up, so I just need to find somebody stupid enough to think that shooting at me is a good idea. So I hang about, just give me a moment to find a relevant idiot. You will do very nicely indeed, just toss a couple of crits into your hand, you'll be dead in no time whatsoever, lovely. Also, nice slow zoom in on my crotch there, good job game. And that is, uh, oh yeah. Just enough to push me over into level 26. Brilliant. So give me a tiny bit of a medicine. Give me a little bit of explosives and maybe, yeah, some energy weapons. And, uh, okay, very unusual one. Today I'm going to take a tiny bit of barter. And, uh, yes, we'll get to why later. Though the skill points, they're really the minor event today. Because, as I say, what I'm really after is a perk and... Uh, if we're going to be visiting the town of children, obviously we ought to take child to heart. And uh, honestly, I think this is a perk a lot of people sleep on because uh, it's very easy to assume that, you know, getting the odd unique dialogue interaction with a child is not going to be that useful. How many children are there really going to be in Fallout 3 that can actually do anything useful for you? And uh, the answer is actually a surprisingly bloody large amount. This is an almost strangely useful perk. Like, there is utility for this all over the game, and not just the base game either. They implemented extra child heart content in the DLC. It's useful in a Mothership Zeta, and Pit, and Point Lookout 2, though not Operation Anchorage, because that's a fictitious video game representing the front line in a war between America and China. So, you know, understandably, there aren't that many children present. So yes, indeed, that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to Lamplight, and we're going to investigate all the various weird and wonderful things that, that this perk gives you access to. And fortunately, we already know where Lamplight is, because yes, the kids told us its location when we released them from Paradise Falls, so we just got to make it over there. Though, um, yes, pick your fast travel location in this bit of the world uh, very carefully, because uh, if you travel here, you'll land literally on top of a mutant, and if you travel here, you'll land literally on top of the Enclave. So I'm going to suggest, yes, the Yalgwai Tunnels. That's not a bad place to start. Nice and quiet. Though while I think about it actually, yes, as I'm literally walking past the Yalgwai Tunnels, uh, I ought to go into the Yalgwai Tunnels. Because seriously, there's something in there I don't want to miss and I don't know why I didn't grab it last time I was here. Right, just a pop hollow point rounds into, yes, that gun, because that will flipping melt any bears in my way, which is uh, flipping marvellous, because uh, this place is really, really bloody weird, which is, uh, there are no notes, no anything, to indicate, yes, what it was that was going on down here, but there's just a huge amount of evidence that, yes, at some point it was really bloody populated. You've just got huge amounts of uh, shelving and various bits of junk and beds and cupboards and all the rest of it just all over the bloody shop. Seriously, just keep going. We've got yet more wardrobes, yet more beds. I don't know what was going on here, but yeah, this place is set up as if it was once the biggest settlement in Fallout 3. But there's no evidence here to tell you what it was, why it was once populated, or what happened to everybody here. Though I guess, you know, we might be able to reasonably assume bears ate them. And speaking of bears, here comes one right now. But yeah, even on the hardest difficulty, hollow point rounds uh, plus creatures uh, who have got no armor combined with crits. Oh yeah, they are going to flipping melt before me. But, 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 that would not be appropriate. No, given what we're after, I'd say this is not the right solution at all. Instead, I'm going to pop a stealth boy, and if at all possible, not to murder any more bears. Beautiful. Right, mosey a bit deeper, giant pile of skeletons. I guess that kind of partially answers my question, what happened to the people who lived here? As I say, they uh, got eaten, apparently, so I should have maybe invested in some better bear defences. Uh, just a sneak around, you bastards. Uh, no uh, trouble with you whatsoever, because yes, we just want to uh, mosey on around to the left over here, because this is where we find, uh, yeah, one of those really bloody difficult to locate bobbleheads. On this occasion, the sneak one. 
And in this mod, oh, I was hoping for something like this. Yes, given it doesn't just boost sneak anymore, sneak attack crits, 10% more damage. Boom. Right, so we just sneak in, grab that, and how about we now just let ourselves out without causing any trouble with the bears whatsoever. Marvellous. Right, that done, just mosey on to the north. This tends to be a pretty quiet bit of the wasteland, so I'm not expecting too much trouble between me and the caverns. Here we go, a handful of trouble, but nothing too dramatic. Just keep my distance from me. Yes, in particular, anything super nasty from Broken Steel. Think I see, yes, a super awesome Mega Scorpion over there. So let's just start be keeping our distance. And uh, there we go. Giant Water Tower is the uh, landmark to look for because uh, that tower over there doesn't really load in until you're really, really bloody close by. So yeah, just walk towards the Water Tower. You'll be doing just fine. And uh, here we go. Welcome to the Town of Lamplight. And yes, obviously under normal circumstances you wouldn't exactly be getting a friendly welcome. But we've done things a little bit out of order in this run. So yes, I've got two things up my sleeve. One, I've already saved a three of their citizens from slavery, which has got to count for something. And two, I'm just really bloody good at dealing with children. So okay, that's about to start being a really bloody useful. Oh, and speak of the devil, hang about. We apparently have got... Right, um... Sammy's here. That's interesting. Hang on, if I just run in while the actual children are returning, can I just get in without ever... Okay, I've literally never seen that before, but um, yes, apparently, if you just happen to arrive at the exact moment that the kids you rescued also get back, you can just get in without ever speaking to McCready. I had no idea that was the case, and honestly, I feel like I'm intruding at this point, so... Okay, um... I mean, does McCready want to speak to me anyway, even though I'm already inside? What in the hell do you think you're doing, Mungo? Okay, that is a different voice line from sometimes, because yes, he's supposed to, like, you know, hold you up at gunpoint that we never actually draws the gun. Uh, but yes, apparently, if you speak to him when you're already inside, uh, there is a slightly different line. And here we flipping go. All sorts of options available to me. So uh, the speech check to let you in is really bloody difficult because uh, this is a town of children that deeply distrust adults. And uh, we'll get to why later. So yeah, while that is possible, it's really bloody tricky. Instead, you need something a bit more specific than just I'm incredibly charming. So uh, saving the kids, uh, that's one thing. Or of course, child at heart, which rather delightfully on this occasion is just basically you just starting to call him a butt face. Oh yeah? You must like having such a good looking butt. And at least it doesn't smell as bad as you do. So uh, yes, apparently we figured out that Mayor McCready might just enjoy a bit of incredibly juvenile back and forth. <laughs> You're pretty funny for a Mungo. Why don't you come on in? And now we are inside, something very interesting is going to happen, which is, yes, a very quick and brutal introduction to how this town operates, which is uh, only children allowed. When you become an adult, which, yes, actually the game is a bit confused on this. Some people say 16, some people say 18, you get kicked out. And poor old Sticky over there, it's apparently his birthday, and it's not a very good one for him. Though, um, fun thing about Sticky, just, uh, you know, as we slip into evil Mirror Universe B for a second. Happy birthday, Sticky. Sorry I missed your party. Yeah, me too. Sorry. There's nothing happy about it. This is the worst day of my life. Oh, he's not bloody wrong, by the way. So, just a blast Sticky in the head, and unfortunately, nobody bloody cares. Like, not in the slightest. Everyone is uh, completely 100% okay with Sticky being dead. Because Sticky is not part of the faction of Little Lamplight anymore. Sticky, in fact, is, yes, now a Mungo. Just a random wastelander. Meaning they completely do not care if he's murdered right in front of them. But no, no, no. We're not just going to shoot Sticky in the face. In fact, Sticky is my new best friend. It's time to go. You know the rules. The rules are stupid. You're a Mungo now. You gotta leave. Maybe I can stay just a little longer? Bye, Sticky. Yeah, bye, Sticky. Don't just stand there. Get out of here already. Okay, no mercy or sympathy whatsoever. He's a Mungo, and he's got to go. I'm Sticky. Forget these little kids. I'll take you to Big Town where the Mungos, I mean, where the grown-ups live. I'm headed there now.
So there we flipping go. Sticky's now going to introduce you to Big Town just in case, yes, you didn't go to Big Town before you made it to Lamplight. Because, yeah, Lamplight's on the main plot thread, whereas a Big Town isn't. So it's entirely possible that when you make it to this place, you won't have heard of Big Town before. So he could be useful just for, you know, one, letting you know it exists, and two, leading you there if you've never come across it. Though I do rather enjoy this, yes, if you demand some payment for your assistance in getting him safely to Big Town... Um, yeah, I got lots of caps, but they, um, they're at Big Town, so I can give them to you when we get there. Yeah! Take me to Big Town, and you'll get your reward. My girlfriend Red has lots of caps. I'll wait for you outside, unless you want to go now. So yeah, Sticky is a delightfully incompetent liar, and uh, yeah, really fun little touch there. He indicates he knows Red, which makes perfect sense, given Red is a, a little bit older than him, though we don't know the precise age. So uh, clearly, him and Red knew each other back in the day. She got kicked out, went over to Big Town, and now he's looking to reunite with her. So uh, it's just kind of cute with those tiny touches uh, that remind you that yes, people who are currently inside Lamplight presumably may well be aware of and used to know the people we've met in Big Town. And crucially, before we set off at Sticky, how about that party hat? Oh, I forgot I had that on. It was for my birthday. Here, you take it. I don't want it anymore. Okay, we're definitely putting that on in honor of Sticky's birthday and him becoming my new best friends. And now Sticky becomes a permanent companion. And by permanent companion, I mean he will just keep following you around until you make it to Big Town. I don't mean permanent in the sense that he will be around for a very long time. He won't. Take him basically anywhere where there's violence, he will die. He's not particularly good in a fight. And the other delightful thing about Sticky is he's part of that tiny subset of characters that Bethesda occasionally loves adding into their games, which is the deliberately annoying character. In fact, I would like to assume that Sticky is somehow distantly related to the adoring fan in Oblivion. Are we there yet? Seriously, you speak to him and the first thing he says is, are we there yet? Sticky is just the absolute perfect annoying character. I love him. And delightfully in universe, your character does acknowledge this, so you can say for the love of God, shut the hell up, Sticky. You shut up! And unfortunately, yes, then you just get stuck in a loop of yelling, you shut up, no you shut up, which is just, aw, oh, Sticky's wonderful. No you shut up! No you shut up! No you shut up! Until eventually you just say shut it. No you shut it! At which point, he starts repeating that instead. I love Sticky so much. Then eventually you can just start yelling, shut up, shut up, shut up at him. La 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 la, you shut up. Sticky's wonderful. But here's why you really don't want Sticky to shut up, because Sticky is a storyteller. And I love Sticky's stories, because they make no cocking sense whatsoever. So I know, let's make up a story to pass the time. Once upon a time, there was this robot. His name was Holy Toledo, and he was really powerful. And one day, this giant super mutant attacked him and tried carrying him off. And what did our hero do, you wonder? He came up with the most cleverest of clever plans. And it worked, and everyone called him a genius. The end. That's all, folks. What you just heard there was a randomly generated story. It has a beginning where he can pick one of four random beginnings, a middle, four random middles, a third part, which is the finale, and then finally a sign-off, which is just a variant of the end. But they get mixed together completely randomly, meaning he always comes up with a random story and it never makes any cocking sense whatsoever. Once upon a time, there was this robot. His name was Super Dupe Dave, and he went all around rescuing people from super mutants and slavers, and other nasty things. And one day, a spaceship from outer space landed right in front of him, and a big green alien jumped out and started eating people. And what did our hero do, you wonder? He came up with the most cleverest of clever plans. And it worked! And everyone called him a genius. The end. So there we go, on that occasion our hero Super Duper Dave had just defeated the aliens. Marvellous, but okay. Sticky, how about we get you to Big Town now? Are we there yet? Though, um, yes, nice easy solution to the Sticky problem. 
He will literally just fast travel with you. So if you've been to Big Town, just go there. If you've not, just go to Vault 101. It's very nearby and the route to Big Town is nice and safe. Arafu would work just fine as well. So uh, yes, how about Sticky? We just get you straight home. There it is. You won't We're get almost away there. That. Come on. Yippee! And there we go, Sticky is delighted to be here and immediately starts sprinting forward into town. Beautiful. Though, um, yes, now he's arrived, possibly he might be a little bit underwhelmed by what's waiting for him in Big Town. So, Sticky, as this is Big Town, the wonderful utopia you told me about, where are all the shops, buddy? I guess adults don't go to stores that much. That must be why there isn't anything here. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Oh, Sticky, he is just desperately looking for the silver lining of Big Town, apparently. And what about the gigantic rusty barricades? Well, I don't know. I guess the grown-ups built it when they got sick of little brats always hanging around them. I bet that's it. And, um, yes, one final sad sting in the tail for Sticky. If you go and speak to Red, she doesn't gain a single extra line of dialogue because Sticky's arrived. So, yes, I think unfortunately Sticky may have rather misunderstood his and Red's relationship. I think I'm going to build a little shrine to you. All I need is some incense sticks and candles. Also, just to confirm, Bittercup is still bloody weird. So, Sticky has been safely delivered to Big Town, though, um, yes, potentially he's not going to have a great life there, but what can you do? He's got a big robot protecting him, it's better than it would have been. So, we're going back to Little Lamplight, and, uh, okay, this town has got some touches I absolutely adore. Like, for example, they've forgotten the origin of their own society, it's got lost to history. They actually can't accurately remember why it is they kick out the Mungos. You see, if you speak to Mayor McCready and ask him why people have to leave eventually... People change when they grow up, and we don't trust Mungos living down here. So we leave for a place called Big Town before we get too old. Kids who grow up fighting and surviving in Lamplight are better trained for the world out there than idiots who are pampered by grown-ups outside. So okay, he's a bit on the vague side, but basically his argument seems to be, yes, people change when they grow up, so therefore they've got to go when they hit a certain age. But... That's not originally why this town implemented this policy. But obviously, yes, in a town like Lamplight, where people get kicked out when they're 16 and or 18, as I say, the game's a bit inconsistent on that point, they're burning through generations really quickly. It's perfectly natural that knowledge is going to get lost or confused. But if you pay attention to a couple of tapes in Lamplight, they give you the real answer. Here we go, just to follow the signs for souvenirs, lovely. And then just nip upstairs to the town shop. And while we're passing by, Nick Nack the shopkeeper, that just means he will trade with you with some really good prices. Sure thing, pal. Special deals for us kids. There we flipping go, making him a really lovely cheap shop. Especially as, yes, despite this being a souvenir shop run by a child, it does still stock a decent amount of, you know, actually useful bits and pieces. But yes, what we're after is that these two diaries are right here. Jason Grant, Entry 1, and Entry 2. Because these diaries are from just after the bombs fell, when the original children here on field trip were trapped underground. Um, I guess this thing is working. I'm Jason Grant. I'm 10 years old. I'm in Miss Delaney's class at Early Dawn Elementary. A month ago, a big war came and everything was destroyed. Except us. We're still okay in these caves. Kind of. Mrs. Delaney went out this morning to get help, and she never came back. But the other adults never came back either. So now it's just us kids. A lot of the others still cry every day. They're really scared. I'm not. There's nothing to be scared of, as long as we don't go outside. Nobody else wants to be in charge, so I'm gonna try. Most of the kids listen to me already, so it should be easy. So there we go. Once upon a time, there was a school trip here. Obviously, they had teachers and chaperones and whatever, but they all went out to get help and never came back. So naturally, that led to a bit of a suspicion of the outside world and adults in general. It's been almost two months and we're all doing pretty good. Even if we are all alone, there's a door that leads to a vault right here in the caverns. Every day we bang and bang, but they won't let us in. 
We can hear them in there. One time, a guy on the other side told us we were dead already. Fuck those grown-ups. Fuck them all. We don't need them ever again. And there we go. Naturally, we know we were coming here to try and get in the back of Vault 87. And now we know from this tape, the original kids banged on the door, tried to get help, but the Vault Dwellers wouldn't help them. Now, we'll find out why that is down the line, but yeah, that was pretty much the foundational myth of this entire society. A misunderstanding. They thought the adults abandoned them and refused to help them, but that's not really what happened at all. The much more likely scenario is uh, the teachers went to get help and, uh, you know, there'd been a nuclear war. There was fallout. They all died before they could find any help or get back to the children. But the kids didn't know that, so they came up with this mythology that adults couldn't be trusted. That over the years got a bit confused, and now we have the myth of the Mungos and people changing and becoming untrustworthy when they grow up. Leading to the very cold way that Sticky was booted out of town when we rolled in past the barricades. And speaking of the teacher, yeah, if you go through to the doctor's office just off the front entrance, you can find a couple of tapes from her, but they don't really clarify precisely what went on in terms of, uh, yeah, the teacher's going missing. It's been four days. Claudia went out this morning to look around and never came back. Then Mr. Cobb went out to look for her and he never came back. So now there's only me, two other teachers, two of the parents who were chaperoning, and a few of the cavern staff. And all these poor kids. We've got enough food and water to last for a while, I guess. But after that, I just don't know. We can't stay in here forever. Can we? So there we go. We can't prove for certain that the adults didn't actually abandon the children, but based on, yes, the testimony there, it seems way more likely they were genuinely going out to try and get help, and yes, unfortunately, a terrible misunderstanding led to this town's foundation myth. And even aside from, yes, a misunderstanding leading to the foundation of this society, Little Lamplight in general is a really bloody weird place. Like, on the one hand, Bethesda put a huge amount of effort into setting out how this society functions. Like, the kids have actually set up a school, where the eldest kids function as teachers. You can literally come in here every morning and the younger kids will come and take their seats in order to get taught things. You can even speak to their teacher who's established as being the oldest kid, so yeah, whoever's oldest, they're responsible for educating the younger kids, and you can ask him about how the education system works. Well, back at the start, all the children had were the notes from the grown-ups that hadn't left yet, and a few books on caves from the store. But after finding the vault, a few scavengers brought back holotapes for basic schooling, reading, basic math, encyclopedias, that sort of thing. We don't get many books anymore from the scav team, but I make sure to keep my own notes on the computer for whoever takes over after I leave. So okay, someone made the effort of making sure we establish how knowledge is, you know, preserved and passed on in the society with its very fast-moving generational system. The basis of the syllabus is survival knowledge, they get out a holotape that they got from the vault, makes perfect sense, and then of course they leave notes so the kid that takes over from Joseph, when Joseph goes to Big Town, he can then pick up the same thing, and the younger kids can keep gaining more and more knowledge. Which explains why, yeah, the kids in Big Town are not completely hopeless at surviving, and though they might be very emotionally immature, they aren't capable of making it to Big Town. So yes, a lot of thought went into how the education system works. We've also got Lucia Dock, who can give you a very quick crash course on, yeah, common health issues, particularly because these children live underground and don't get any sunlight. We've got Claire, who can tell you about, yes, what these children eat and drink. This society is, in general, surprisingly well thought through. Probably the most well thought through society in all of Fallout 3. Aside, of course, from one big question, arguably the biggest question of all, which is, how the cock does this society function in terms of demographics? There is actually a decent population here. It's probably one of the most popular societies in all of bloody Fallout 3. Far too many for this to just be the children who were left behind by young mothers after they got kicked out for becoming Mungos. Plus, no one in Big Town or Little Lamplight mentions that scenario, which you think they would if that was in any way common, given, yes, there would be traumatised young mothers separated from their children everywhere. So we've got to reasonably assume that's not where all these children come from. Which leads to, yes, the only possible viable solution. 
the slightly horrifying realization that this place basically functions as a wasteland orphanage, taking in children who were left at the gates. And we know that's at least partially true because there is an instance in Fallout 3 where you can arrange for a child to be adopted into Little Lamplight. We'll get to that in a future episode. So yes, it's most likely that Wasteland parents who can't care for their children just leave them at the gates to be adopted into this society that's at least somewhat functional, though meaning that yes, every child in this society was presumably separated from their parents as a baby because the parents weren't allowed inside. But uh, yes, maybe Bethesda decided that was sufficiently dark, they didn't want to go into full details about it. So yes, brushing aside the nightmarish horrific realisation about what's going on in this society and how it actually functions, uh, let's talk about something much lighter and fluffier, which is... Uh, all the lovely things that the child at heart perk gets you inside this town. Okay, how about we start off with, yes, the nice simple ones here, which is the shop we saw earlier gives you a nice discount if you've got child at heart. Meanwhile, we just uh, track down Billy, though, speaking of which, that can be, um, yes, a bit trickier than you might expect. Funny old thing about this town, which is, uh, it's actually quite large. The corridors between the areas are pretty bloody long, and plenty of kids just spend their entire day just walking in big circles and sometimes running in big circles because they're kids and they're playing and unfortunately they can run as fast as you. Meanwhile, though you may notice there's a kid ahead of me, I can't check who it is with VATS because you can't murder children and that means you can't VAT scan them. So yes, spotting which kid is which to distance can be a bit on the tricky side. Here we go, I found the lad. So Billy, or as the local kids rather cruelly call him, Billy. Hello, I'm Billy. Welcome to Little Lamplight. Hey, you look like you're handy with the weapon. I got kicked off the scab team, so I guess I don't need mine anymore. Wanna buy my Wazer rifle? 500 caps and it's all yours. So there we go. Poor old Billy would happily sell me a laser rifle. 500 caps up front, 250 if you can pass a advantage check. But for me, nice and free and... Uh, Okay, so funny old thing about this weapon, the Wazer Rifle, which is uh, back when this game came out, this was a really good weapon because next to the Laser Rifle, it's just superior. It just straight up does uh, significantly more damage. But then the DLC came along uh, and yes, with the introduction of uh, the Troy Beam Laser Rifle and the Metal Blaster in the pit, yeah, the Wazer Rifle just doesn't really stand up anymore. That's a great idea. You take it and good walk out there. So there we go, one weighs a rifle for free. And yes, funny old thing about this weapon, it showed up again in Fallout 4. Sean can give it to you if you do a handful of procedurally generated missions for him after the end of the main game. Though, funny old thing about that weapon, unlike the weighs a rifle, which is actually, you know, a unique special weapon, it's got stuff about it that no other laser rifle does, yeah, the weighs a rifle in Fallout 4 is a duplicate of a different legendary weapon that also exists in the game, because the laser rifle in that game is a never-ending laser rifle, which you can also get from University Point. For some reason, yes, Bethesda put two identical legendary weapons in Fallout 4, and I don't know why, it's really weird. So okay, what we've got there is a couple of a nice, easy, measurable benefits to taking the perk child to heart. But I think those are the ones that everybody knows about. Nice shop discount, free gun, a very nice indeed. But there's also a bunch of other tiny bits and pieces that get added into the game. And to my mind, some of the tiny touches in this town are some of the most interesting. What is a bit unfortunate though is yes, my personal favourite is a bit temperamental. And you know, Fallout 3 being Fallout 3, this one bugs out a lot and sometimes you just do not see it if the game kind of breaks. But, the little kids who are running around, many of them are unnamed little lamplighters. And they do something really fun if you've got child to heart. Assuming as I say, the gamer hasn't broken. Tag. You're it. Oh, there are flipping ears. I got it to trigger. Yes, the kids who are running around, uh, they're not just running around because, you know, they're idiots. They're running around uh, because they're playing a game of tag. And if you've got child at heart, then they can tag you into the game. Hey, new kid, try and catch me. And there we go, a different invitation into the same game, which is marvellous. And uh, if we're lucky, yes, on occasion, they can also acknowledge that you've tagged them back. Though, on this occasion, yes, that one's refusing to trigger. But this only happens if you've taken child at heart. Because, yes, if they've let you into the town because they accept you're a kid, as a result of that, they're also willing to let you join in all their games, which is, oh, that's such a tiny touch and I love it. 
Another cute touch I really like, by the way, is uh, if you know the right people to ask, you can actually learn a fair bit more about these kids uh, than they might immediately let on. Hey, new kid. I don't know if anyone told you yet, but let me set the record straight. I'm princess. When you're around me, I'm in charge. You shut up and do what I say, because I'm boss around here. That clear? Now, who are you? I like Princess. Princess is great, and yes, indeed, a whole bunch of a child at heart options if I want to, you know, be lovely and nice to her and whatnot. What we really want to do, however, is, a yes, ask her about how she got her nickname. I don't need to explain myself to you, Mungo. Shut up and get lost. In fact, don't you ever bother me about something as stupid as nicknames again. Now, Princess will never give you any more information about her name. But now you've spoken to her about her name, that opens up some new options elsewhere. So just wait around a few hours, and yes indeed, Princess is regularly joined by Sammy. These two guard the back gate together. Naturally, of course, Sammy is very appreciative to me because I got him out of captivity, so a nice simple speech check. How about you tell me why Princess just got so angry about her nickname? So, a long time ago, Princess convinced everyone that she should be mayor. The first thing she did as mayor was try to insist the title be changed to Princess. It was five minutes before McCready punched her in the nose and got picked as the new mayor. It was awesome! So there we go. She was apparently only the mayor for five bloody minutes. Yeah, McCready said we needed someone to watch out for us, not to lord over us. Then he popped her one. She hasn't even tried since then. That's why he stays mayor, too. I hope I can be that cool someday. Fun fact, if you actually speak to McCready, he will tell you that exact same story, but he doesn't mention that the person who punched his princess, so that's rather polite of him, that, you know, he spares her the embarrassment of dragging her in front of the newcomer. And also potentially of interest, yes indeed. Does princess still hold a grudge? No way. I think she's got a crush on him. She's all weird for him. And now you've gathered that information, you can stop being an absolute flipping jerk to Princess. Why? Because I'm Princess a little lamplight? Oh no, 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 no. I heard McCready gave you a damn good walloping. Oh yeah? Well, that was a long time ago. Now RJ's my best friend. Someday, we're gonna be boyfriend and girlfriend, and then he'll kick you out. And there we flipping go. Sounds like Sammy was bang on the money. Princess is definitely into McCready, but uh, yes, with a nice simple charisma check, you can just start making stuff up and lying to her about how he spends his time with the Dr. Lucy instead. He doesn't really, we're just making this up to mess with a child. That's not true! You're a liar! Shut your stupid face, liar! I know RJ likes me, he really does, really! Just leave me alone, you mungo jerk! I hate you! So there we go, that's how you lose karma by bullying a child. I don't want to talk with you. And there we go, as soon as you've done that, Princess will now refuse to engage with you any further. And speaking of characters refusing to speak to you anymore, there's also a way to basically annoy McCready so much, he refuses to do business with you, and uh, this one's really rather obscure. Literally, all you need to do is speak to McCready and then come out of the conversation immediately, okay? Yeah, that's Absolutely fine. And then straight afterwards, uh, speak okay, to him so again. In, I... And now just yep. keep doing that over and over again until eventually he starts getting annoyed. Did you get hit in the head? You have to pester me every time a stray thought happens to wander into that hollowed out melon you call a skull? There we go, speak to him enough times, all of a sudden he starts getting a lot more annoyed about you constantly coming up to him. But no, 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 we're not done yet, McCready. Okay, what the hell is wrong with you, Mungo? This had better be important. And there we go, he's getting more and more annoyed. Why are you still pestering me, you moron? I think he's pretty much at the end of his tether right now. Oh, this is great fun. No, you know what? You can go take a hike and save me. Get out of my town! There we flippy go! Not only does he refuse to speak to you, he actually banishes you from the town. Now fortunately, yes, this is not actually as bad as it sounds. 24 hours in game later, he will come round 
and pretend none of this ever happened. But for the time being, he's not willing to speak to you, which, just a reminder, basically is a block to continuing the main mission. You can't get into Murder Pass, and I'm pretty sure Joseph won't help you into the back of Vault 87. So, yes, basically, he just blocks progression of the main plot of Fallout 3 for an in-game day, which is beautiful. Okay, that's characters who you could really bloody annoy, but how about characters you can make really bloody happy? Because, uh, yes, passing by over here, Knock Knock. I love Knock Knock. And as you may guess from the name, she's the town's official comedian. So go on, Knock Knock. Hit me with a joke. Prepare to be amused. Knock Knock. Who's there? Noah. And hilariously, yes, with sufficient intelligence, you can beat her to the punchline. In fact, even better, you come up with a punchline that she prefers to the one she was about to use. So yes, indeed, Knock Knock, know a place where you could get some better jokes. Hey, that's good. I was just gonna say, know a place where I can get some food. And here's a really important thing right now, which is, uh, if either you tell her she's funny, or you light her with a speech check but she buys it, then that leads into the second, much more cool part of this conversation. Gee, thanks. I have to admit, most of them aren't really funny. At least not ha-ha funny. They're more like a tradition. Most of them were passed down from this book we found down back, called Vault Boy's Big Book of Laughs for Kids. They're not really funny, but something about hearing them is a little comforting, you know? You know what? I actually do really get that. Like, you know, there's something deeply comforting and lovely about a terrible old joke that everybody knows. So, uh, yes indeed, Knock Knock. How about coming up with some new jokes or stories? Oh, we've got lots of funny incidents. Like when Sammy shot the raider who thought he was a girl. That sort of stuff. But we don't really get a lot of new stories from outside. The scav teams spend all their time hidden, so they don't get much news, see? I'd sure like to hear more tales from the great big outdoors myself. Actually, if you hear any, feel free to tell me. And here we flipping go. We can start telling her a story right now. What's really cool about the story is, uh, just like Sticky earlier this episode uh, had various different building blocks he could put together to form a story, when you tell your story to Knock Knock, you can do the same thing. Because what you're doing is telling the story of the game, like the main plot of Fallout 3. You're telling it to Knock Knock, but you can choose how you do it. So, uh, not long ago, uh, my father left me, so I went searching for him. So, okay, like, you know, classic hero's journey, etc, etc. Or if you want to, a bit more of a neutral response. I left my dull life behind uh, to search for fame and fortune in the wasteland. Uh, or alternatively, long ago, my people were buried away. Now I've arisen to terrorize the waits. Or you could just say story time's over for now. But no, 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 no. 100% my people were buried away and now I've arisen to terrorize the waste. Because if you ask various societies I've engaged with, that would be their take on it, yes. A horror story, huh? So you are here to terrorize evil or is it more a generalized sort of terrorizing? I mean, you wouldn't do anything to hurt someone who was faithfully telling your tale, right? Would you? So, um, whatever happens next, it's nothing bad to me, right? And then we continue on the story towards the waters of life. I found Dad, but then he died protecting me in his life's work. I enlisted the aid of the Brotherhood of Steel in my heroic adventures, or the wasteland is littered with the victims of my vengeance and amusement. And uh, I'm going to be honest, that's actually, yes, completely accurate. But we already provide you with plenty of amusement already, right? Like, enough so we don't have to end up as victims or anything? Maybe I shouldn't ask, but I have to know. Is there more to this story? And hilariously, there's not. Because I don't know how Fallout 3 ends because my character hasn't got there yet. But, if you come back here after escaping from Raven Rock and wrapping up the game, you can give her the final chapter of the story and complete it. And if you do, she will start telling the other people in Lamplight the story. As in, if she bumps into them, her incidental dialogue will start including the story. The exact version you told her. Whether you went for like, you know, the moral or renegade or neutral options, she will repeat it 
as you told it to her, which is just absolutely beautiful. But I'm pretty sure she won't do it now because, yeah, she only starts when the story is complete. So, uh, okay, if I remember later, we might pop back here in a future episode just to give her the final chapter. But I love this interaction. This is just so super cute. Okay, moving on to business, because you may recall earlier this episode, I boosted Barter, which is generally a thing you just never do in Fallout 3. It's just not worth it. But in Lamplight, there are actually a couple of really cool hidden interactions that utilize the Barter skill. In particular, hang on, I'm pretty sure I just saw over here, we need to have a chat with Zep. Hey there, you have any Nuka Cola? Even just a bit? Can I have some? Be your best friend. Honest, totally, not even kidding. And gosh flipping darn it, unfortunately, yes, I got lucky early this episode. Because yes, the tag interaction was willing to work. But for some reason, yes, sometimes Fallout 3 is going to Fallout 3 and Zips decided to break today. Either the game's broken or the mods broke Fallout 3, I'm not sure. But yes, as you probably might be able to guess from the way he opened this exchange, Zip would love me to give him a new Coca-Cola. And I've got new Coca-Cola. I brought it specially for this, kids but he's just refusing to take it. So, okay, Zip does actually have something really interesting going on in the background, okay? We're all going to pretend we can see this, which is, yes, if you give him a new Coca-Cola, he's got a really cool hidden mechanic, which is a probability table that's affected by your barter skill. So, if your barter is under 30, he will only ever give you one thing in return for your Nuka Cola, and that is a single 10 millimeter bullet, which will tell you is lucky, but it's not, it's just a normal bullet. He's lying to you, what a bastard. However, that is not the only thing he can give you. There are various barter thresholds, which as soon as you're above them, he starts giving you better and better stuff. And to my mind, just above 30, where I deliberately brought my character at the start of this episode, is actually bang on the sweet spot. Because at that level, between 30 and 50, there is a 33% chance that Zip gives you 24556 bullets. Which is actually a really bloody good deal for me, because I can plug those straight into that gun, which is an absolute cocking beast. Though he can still give you, yes, the single rubbish 10mm bullet. It just gets less and less likely as your barter goes up. At the very top levels, like, you know, 70, 90 or thereabouts, he can also give you stim packs, mentats, and even ultimately micro fusion cells. Now, luckily, to save my embarrassment, there is actually one other thing that Barter does in this town. Another really cool exchange. In fact, to my mind, uh, the coolest single mission mechanically in all of Lamplight. So, uh, okay, just a uh, nip around here. And yes, indeed, we need to speak to the magnificent Eclair and his wonderful hats. So, as I was mentioning earlier, Eclair. Fill me in on, yes indeed, where the food comes from to keep the society going. Honestly, when we can't scavenge some from outside, we mostly scrape it off the walls and skim it off the water. No, really. Most of our food comes from fungus that grows in these caves. It's not so bad when you get used to it, and we don't have much choice. At least it's filling, so we don't have to eat much of it. But man, oh man, it tastes terrible! So there we flipping go. We've got an answer as to, yes, what they eat when they can't just scavenge a bit from the outside. Because as was mentioned earlier, they do indeed send teams out into the wasteland. But here in these caves, they can also grow fungus that keeps them going, even if it tastes disgusting. But, Eclair, give me some more information because things are about to get interesting. They say the fungus grows in the pools where the first lamplighters dumped the mungos. That's about the most they ever helped us. I don't know how true that is. But I know, sometimes, the scav team comes back with this strange meat that tastes terrible, but the fungus loves it. I don't know where they find that meat, but if you could bring some back, I'd be glad to trade fungus for it. Of course, McCready'd have to okay it. So okay, at first glance this looks like a fairly simple exchange mission. You get these all over Fallout 3. Bring this guy X, he'll give you Y. On this occasion, deliver strange meat so that he can pop it in the pool. The fungus grows better. They've got disgusting fungus, magnificent. And as a result, I get some fungus too. Why my character would want disgusting fungus, I don't know. You just specifically told me it was disgusting. But, 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 crucially, that's not actually what's going on. Like he says, he can't authorize that deal. You need to go and approve this with McCready. And when I say approve, I mean negotiates. 
Unlike, say, trading scrap metal for caps or karma in Megaton, where the price is just fixed, it's just a function of the unmarked mission, on this occasion, the deal you get varies depending on how well you negotiate with McCready. So welcome to Universe B, where you may notice I'm still level 25 and thus I don't have child of hearts. My barter accordingly is a lowly 29, but that's okay, because I'm just swimming in copies of Salesman Weekly. 54, very very nice indeed. And now we're gonna have a nice chat with McCready to try and get a deal done. The cave's fungus, sure. It's good for food and medicine. And it's the main fucking reason we've stayed alive down here. So, you want a slice of that grey-green gold, huh? I think maybe we could come to an arrangement. What are you offering? And seriously, McCready is a vicious negotiator, so uh, with Barter of 50, and honestly that's pretty high in Fallout 3, you do not get a good deal out of this guy. More stuff for us, and more chance of you getting shot, stumbling back here, choking on your own blood while we point and laugh? Sounds good. So how about this? For every three pieces of strange meter buff out doses you bring in, you'll get one piece of fungus. Take it or leave it. Just talk to Lucia or Claire about what they need and stop bothering me about it. So there we go. That there is the basic deal. All I get is, yeah, 1k fungus for three bits of human flesh. Terrible. Terrible deal. But as you get better at bartering, you can come back and renegotiate, moving up to 1k fungus for only two bits of human flesh. But back in Universe A, where I get on really bloody well with children, we can do even better, coming up with a by far the best deal he's going to offer. Here we go at the child at heart option, beautiful, but there is also a speech check. Do not do this, because it will get you a bit of cave fungus up front. But after you do this, basically, yes, because you threatened to blow up their cavern and leave them stuck down here forever, basically, they are never going to do business with you again. This is you completely nuking your relationship with the town. So uh, even if you can pass this speech check, you absolutely shouldn't, because uh, Eclair will just refuse to do business with you in future. Instead, a child at heart, McCready, give me the good stuff. Well, and it'd lighten the load for our scab team a lot. Since you're pretty much one of us, here's the deal. For every piece of strange meat or buff out you bring in, you'll be repaid with one cube of fungus. You couldn't ask for a better deal. Talk with Eclair for the strange meat, or to Lucy about the buff out. They've got uses for them. So there we flipping go, a one for one deal, and yes indeed, just in the same way that Eclair wants strange meat, Lucy also wants buff out which she can use to create various medicines to deal with the rickets that apparently occurs in this society. So yeah, Child at Heart gets you a much nicer deal with McCready, and also, you know, less mentions of laughing at you while you're dying of blood loss, which is nice too. But yeah, I just really love that you can actually renegotiate that deal to make it better and better as you pick up relevant skills. So yes, if you go from a bar to 50 to bar to 75 up to child to heart, you can just go and renegotiate to make the terms more favourable and ah. Oh. It's just a really cool system that basically never shows up elsewhere in Fallout 3, but it's so cool. I do hope we get more of that sort of thing in future. Now buff out of course is nice and easy, you'll find it pretty much bloody everywhere. Human flesh however is a bit more on the complicated side, though yes, before we get into, you know, scavenging for corpses and whatnot, you may notice something a bit peculiar in what was just said to us. Which is yes, a class specifically saying that human flesh being ducked in the pools makes the fungus grow. And we know he's not wrong, they're not mistaken or something, because they've brought back strange meat before, dumped it in the pools, and the fungus does grow really well. So he's correct, it does take human flesh to grow the fungus, but um, yes. They discovered this originally, or rather, their predecessors did, by dumping the original mungos into the pools, but... That doesn't stack up with what we've heard about what happened to the Mungos. The Mungos didn't die and leave their corpses in the cave. They all left. That was the entire bloody point, in fact. Mrs. Delaney went out this morning to get help. And she never came back. But the other adults never came back either. So now it's just us kids. So there we go, we have confirmation from Jason Grant who was right there during the initial generation who said they didn't come back or we were left alone. No mention of corpses of anything. So yes, I've got to assume this is just a bit of an oversight that was left in the game in error. Still, let's not worry about that. Let's worry instead about where we're going to get this human flesh from because 
I think I know a perfect destination to make this trade extremely lucrative for me. Here we go, the most peaceful, beautiful, wonderful neighborhood in all of Fallout 3. Welcome to Andale. Well, hi there. Welcome to Andale. I'm Willie Wilson, though folks just call me Bill. Is there anything I can do for you? Oh, what a lovely, friendly group of individuals. I think I'm going to get on just fine here. So, how about we just, just nip inside these lovely houses right here and have a lovely poke around in their refrigerator because who would have thought it? Ten strange meat. Honestly, I feel like I shouldn't tell them. Like, they'd feel terrible if they knew they'd bought human flesh by mistake. Like, it would just eat them up inside. It's better they don't know. So I'm just going to take it and you know what? I'm doing them a favour, really. So there we go, two fridges gets me 20 strange meat, 20 weight, 40 value. Let's see if maybe we can improve that by doing the trade. Oh great, the fungus pools will gobble this right up. I love how happy he is about that, and uh, yes, unfortunately, you have to do this one at a time. And there we go, 20k fungus, and as a result the value is... Okay, it's 100, which is not exactly spectacular. Really, I've not made much profit at all. But at the bare minimum, I have actually, you know, made profit. Had I taken the original deal, which you need a barter 50 to do, you actually make a loss in terms of the value, which is hilarious. And to be honest, yes, the value of K-Fungus is not in, you know, its actual value on the open market. It's in the fact it reduces your rats, which very few items do. To be honest though, I get my enjoyment primarily from it just, yeah, the really interesting negotiation mechanic, more than like, you know, the actual resources I get out of doing the trades. So there you go, a whole bunch of interesting stuff hidden away inside a little lamplight for you today, and uh, I'd say that's probably enough for now. But next week, I'd say we probably want to head back to that lovely community I just paid a visit to a moment ago. Because something in the back of my mind just tells me that yes, there might be something going on under the surface in Andale. And I don't mean the fact that, you know, they're cannibals and eating people. No, 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 no. I mean the secret that's buried underneath the secret. So, uh, hopefully, you join me next week for that. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And this has been Fallout, Tale of Two Wastelands. Thank you very much, and goodbye. If we just hide the bodies, nobody needs to know about this. Yes! My stupid, stupid plan has worked! It turns out I'm a genius! The giant rat scorpion is not gone! Oh, hang on, there's, there's more yet though, I'm still being very shocked. Guys, where's the NCR? Nobody needs to know.